Hello, my name is Dmitry Nesterov and I'm a concert pianist. And my name is Olga Kotova and I am a violinist at the Kalvik Harmonic Orchestra. Dmitry and I are known as Duo Solista and we have been coming to perform in the CASP several times since 1995. During the summer of 2022, we were able to have a conversation with Marilyn Massey at her house. She's a very influential figure in the Caspian area, and she greatly impacted the cultural life of the region by teaching music to kids and bringing various artists to the Casp. We would like to share Marilyn's insights and memories on her accomplishments and her life. We believe that it is very important for the younger generations to learn from the experience of the elderly. Without this, it would be impossible to maintain and further develop the musical education and creative environment that the older generation spent countless hours to build. Hope you will enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Hello, Marilyn. Good morning. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us to give some reflections on your life as a musician and a person. I'm going to ask you some questions. The first one will be please tell us why and how you became a musician. Uh, I think I was about three years old and I can remember sitting in the crib listening to my mother teach piano lessons and I would climb out of the crib and climb over to the piano and try to play by ear because my dad had a gifted ear played by ear and, and I had received that but my mother not, didn't have that and she said you're not learning to play the piano that way you're going to learn how to read and do it properly so I started lessons. Wonderful. Uh, uh, tell us uh, what city or town did you I grew up in Drumheller, Alberta, and that's where the Tyrell Museum is today. And that's where I had my first music lessons, and eventually we moved out to the family farm, which is called Machichi, pointing to the Hand Hills, which is a, a native name. And that's where I was until my father passed away, and then we moved into Calgary. Okay, and why the cusp? We went from Calgary to Nakus because my mother grew up here. The Powell Creek is named after the family, and they had bought 10 acres of land, supposedly to have an orchard, but had to take down all the trees and start all over again. So my grandfather ended up going back to Drumheller to mine, and when my younger uncle George went to university, mother joined him as her, his housekeeper, and that's how she met my dad and we ended up living in Drumheller before we moved to Calgary after his death. Okay, wonderful. And I also know that you spent two years uh, living and studying in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell us more? Okay, so while I was in Calgary, I um, took piano lessons with Molly Pierce, who had been, along with Gladys Egbert, the first uh, Canadians to win a five-year scholarship to the Royal Academy of Music and Auntie Molly was brought up on the Tobias Mate relaxation method of playing at the piano. His most famous, um, shall we say, pianist was Myra Hess, who was known for playing right through the bombings in London during World War II. <laughs> and there is a competition now in her name that uh, you can win. And uh, one of the artists that we brought here, Angela Gia Kim, had won this scholarship and she wondered who Tobias Matze was and who Myra Hess was. And so she studied all his methods and she learned all over again how to play the piano. And when she came, it was like, huh? Watching someone going, exactly, where did she? And so she told me that she had changed her whole method of playing. And, and she could just sit at the piano and play with her eyes closed, just going like crazy. Oh, that's wonderful because yeah. I know when you play instrument, you better enjoy it and mm -hmm. have fun and mm -hmm. this ease yeah. rather than fight with the piano. There was only two groups that brought us in, her in. It was uh, Caslow with Jack McDowell and ourselves. And she flew in from New York to Vancouver. 
Vancouver to Castlegar. They picked her up in Castlegar, then she was brought up to Cas to Nacusp from Castlegar or from um, uh, from Caslow, and then we drove her back to <laughs> to Castlegar to take the flight out again. <laughs> it was quite and nobody else in in British Columbia took her, but she came for two groups. I think that's fabulous. Actually, coming all the way from New York City, yes, I think that was something else. But it was wonderful to see Tobias Mate method being performed just beautifully. Mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. I know there's some other people who continue his method, like Dorothy Taubman. Uh, but anyway, we also know that you are teaching the violin. Mm -hmm. Well, when I arrived in Calgary, I think uh, just before my 10th birthday, I started violin lessons. My mother handed me her old violin and said, you're going to start violin lessons. <laughs> so Mary Short, who had been, uh, an, uh, I guess you call it, she was trained at the Royal College of Music rather than the Royal Academy in London. And she was the only violin teacher from Red Deer down to the border when she came back from London. Imagine being only one violin teacher. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, her mother was also a piano teacher. So whenever I went for violin lessons, she always accompanied me. And that was fabulous because uh, you didn't have to go out and find a, a accompanist. I didn't realize how wonderful that was until I went to England and had to find an accompanist to do my exams. <laughs> because my violin teacher there did not play the piano. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And also, I know in the cast you were quite prominent. So my mother grew up here because they came and got 10 acres of land up in Glenbank. And when her younger brother, my Uncle George, went off to university, she went to Drumheller to look after her dad. And I brought her back to her roots when we had lived in Calgary for 40 years. And in that 40 years, I went to university. I became a sessional instructor at the university and graduated in 1971. And my grade one teacher that taught me out in Machichi graduated with me because they were sending them out for six months of training right after the war. And that's when she finished her degree. <laughs> yeah, one of those marvelous things you kind of go, wow. <laughs> yeah. So tell, tell us how it felt to live in the cars Oh, well, now, um, my, one of my mother's best friends was uh, Betty Walton, and she had been the principal teacher here for many years, but they used to get together all the time. And so we always knew her as Aunt Betty. And so I um, decided to come out and see if we can find a place to live because my mother couldn't climb up and down the stairs in Calgary anymore. And I thought, I'm not taking her back to Drumheller because that's not the best place for mom because of the death of her, her husband, etc., etc. And so I thought, well, let's bring her out to her roots. And so I came out in March of 1989 and um, set up all things and saw this house was for sale. And what happened is that there had been a bid on it already, and so um, Ken Marshall was taking me all around to see me all these different houses, and I said, thank you very much, but I, I think I'll wait and see. So I went back to Calgary, and uh, at Christmas time, oh, that would be the summer before. So at Christmas time of 1988, I came through to see one of my granddaughters, as I called them. Uh, she was in Kelowna. And so I decided to drive back to see, and the house was still for sale. So the, the, the bid had gone, not gone through. So I went back to Calgary and called a friend of mine who was also uh, a real estate agent. And we sold her house in Calgary and bought this house in 24 hours. That's how fast it went through. It was just like, ooh. <laughs> And so in March of 1989, we had already sold our house and we were ending paying rent because you only have 90 days to get out. We weren't moving till the 1st of July. So we ended up paying rent in our own house for the last month before we got out here. And when we got out here, oh, and I, when I came out in March of 1989, I went to the post office to get all the materials set up and so forth. And there was a lady there with 
bright white hair, blue eyes, and she said, Alice Meal. And she looked at me and she said, that wouldn't be Alice Powell by any chance. And I said, why, yes, it is. And Anton Chiarty was coming through performing. And so I said, I noticed that there is a sign up for Anton Chiarty. Where is he performing? So she told me how to find a ticket. She told me where the Bonington Arts Center was, etc. It had already started, and it was in its early beginnings then. And so, so what year was approximately? this would be March of 89. Yeah. And so I went out to the concert, and I was sitting up underneath where the light booth is, and uh, ended up sitting beside the teacher from New Denver who had taught all my cousins while they were living here. So we were chit-chatting, and I said, oh, there's Aunt Betty. I better make sure at intermission I go down and talk to her. And as I walked down the aisle, I said, hi, Aunt Betty. She says, you don't have to tell me you're moving here. If the whole town knows that Alice Powell is coming back. And I went, that's Dorothy. <laughs> it was like, wow. And within that time period of March and July when I arrived, I had students call from Burton and Folk here. And I had 15 students lined up by long distance before I arrived to play, to teach piano. Not in the cusp, down the valley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I already had 15 students when I arrived here. So they were driving to your house from... And they all came up here and had lessons here, yes. Oh, yeah. So it slowly spread from there because uh, the cusp people, not, that was one of the first ones, was the lady who won the award in Ontario. She was one of the first ones. She said, oh, I've been going up to Revelstoke for piano lessons. Let me switch over because she went to the church. And she was playing the piano music for the church at that time. So that's how Terry Mays and I got started, and through her, it just started spreading. Uh, can you tell us also, besides your own private students, mm -hmm. what else did you do in that Okay, class? so the, when I went to that first concert, people started asking questions who I was, and so it was Dave and Karen McMillan, who are now retired, like myself, but she was on the council, of the Arts Council, and so she said, well, Marilyn, why don't we invite you to come to an Arts Council meeting? So that's that would be in 1990, 89 when I started, and by 1990 they had me on as the concert series board of directors. And so I've been doing that ever since 1990. Okay, so wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us some names uh, who came to Nakas to perform uh, with the uh, Arts Council? You are. <laughs> well, uh, Mark Jablonski who I grew up with at the Bell School of Fine Arts. So Mikey Yeah, and... Um, Michael Kim. Yes, and Michael Kim, who also took master classes with Mark, and several of the other students of um, Boris Rabakin, because when I went to university, I also took piano lessons again with Mr. Rabakin, and then I also took um, uh, with Luigi Zaninelli, I took... Uh, composing and I was doing composition lessons with him for two years after I graduated so I could do my three years yeah. uh, and I know Gloria Sarina also played here yes how about a Jane Coop I know Jane Coop came here and she practiced here at the piano oh, wow. because she wanted more than just a, a warm-up at the piano in the Bonington and so she was in here and I came in here and said, can I get you a cup of coffee or a glass of water? She said, no. I said, so I understand you studied with Gladys Egbert. And she said, yes. I said, so did I. And her mother went, huh? <laughs> she had no idea. Yeah. yeah. I know Gladys Egbert is quite prominent uh, teacher. They even have a school named after yes. her. Yeah. And also um, Mark Shablonsky came down from Edmonton and took lessons with him or with her. And the other person that I knew very well was Andy Dawes, and Andy Dawes and Mark and I all grew up at the band school from the age of 14 onwards. Right, so oh, you, also, uh, you also went to the band school of the mm -hmm, arts. Mm -hmm. So can you briefly tell how it felt there? Uh, I would win scholarships because mother not having that much money or time, as you can see on the wall, I have five awards up there for piano and violin as the top marks in the province of Alberta. And so I would win scholarships, so the, and the money would go straight to my piano or violin teachers. Uh, in those days, you didn't see the money as a student. You only saw the teachers getting the money. 
So that's how I helped my mother out. So I worked very hard to make sure I was doing the best of everything I can do. And uh, what happened is when I went up to Banff School and I was 14, I ran into Clayton Hare, who was the conductor of the Pelgrim Philharmonic at that time, but also did the string classes up in Banff. And he ran into me at the festival and he said, Marilyn, I understand you're going to the Banff School this summer. I said, yes. And he said, are you bringing your violin? I said, uh, well, uh, I wasn't planning to because I have a, I'm in the piano class. He said, we need all the string players we can get. You're coming to Banff. And he was the one that started me off in learning how to play in string orchestras. And it spread from there because when I went to Toronto in 1987, when I graduated from university, I won a $500 scholarship to go to study at the Royal College or Royal Toronto, Toronto Conservatory of Music. And at that time, it was connected to the university. So you had a combination of things going on. It's no longer like that now. And so Dr. Mazzolini, when he sent me up for all my lessons, including Pierre Souverain on the piano, said to me, now, I got everything. I said, well, what about my violin? And he said, I'm sorry, your scholarship doesn't cover violin lessons. I said, oh, so what am I supposed to do? Stick it in the closet, forget I own it? And he said, no you are going to become a member of the orchestra. And for that year's training, I went back to Calgary and Mary Short by this time was sharing the concert mistress position. So I auditioned for uh, the orchestra and became a member of the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra before I took off to London. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, that's so wonderful. So I have another question. I know you also was conducting the choir here in Macau. So okay. So Part of my training, of course, when I went to university was to play how to teach band, how to teach choir, and the string department also, but because I was already a string person, I didn't do as much in that area. I did learn to play the cello, and I did learn to play the string bass, and I ended up playing the string bass in their uh, band at the university, and I got uh, really quite annoyed that the university had no orchestra. So I worked with Dr. Doolittle, who was the string teacher there at that time. And eventually they formed a university orchestra. And so we actually got university orchestras to start playing. So we got the band members and we got string players and we did the whole thing. Yeah, and uh, who else? A lot of the students that I knew through the years, like um, Bruce Weecroft, he took lessons with me. I taught him his theory. <laughs> when I was a teenager, my, my mother would turn over her piano students to me and I'd teach them their theory because I already had done it, right? And so Bruce Recroft um, uh, helped me find a piano when I finally moved out of my mother's house and into my own house. So he helped me find a piano that I actually um, had for many years until I moved out here and then my son got it. <laughs> yeah. So, and he was the only one of my son and daughter that really tried to play the piano. But uh, because of his accident and his leg being severed and put back on again, he's never done anything since. So, what do you do? We'll see. Uh, so my, my question was, if you compare um, school systems nowadays and then... In the well, you know, this is what part of uh, why I ended up moving out here is because uh, we ended up with a superintendent who canceled all traveling teacher positions. And by this time, Lloyd Erickson, who had been the band teacher and I played for his choir at the high school, was also the supervisor of the music department downtown in uh, the Calgary Board of Education. And so I've taught band and uh, social studies and English uh, in two schools. Bishop Pinkham and F.E. Osborne. And while I was at F.E. Osborne, uh, Mr. Mossop retired and Mr. Erickson became the full supervisor instead of the assistant. And while I was gone away that summer, he had moved me from F.E. Osborne to Rideau Park School to start the string program for Calgary. And so I came home, I think it was just two or three days before school started because we had gone on one of those long holidays. <laughs> 
And, oh, I know what it was. We went off to uh, Vancouver Island. I was learning how to camp. <laughs> People had lent us their camping gear, and that's what I was learning what to do. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, what happened is that when I came back, I got the phone call from Mr. Erickson said, My dear, you are no longer at F.E. Osborne. You are now at Rita Park School. You're starting a new string program, and you're going to be traveling from Rita Park to Elbow Park to Earl Grey and William Reed. And I said, what? <laughs> and so that's what I did. I was a traveling strict teacher. So I had three elementary schools and an elementary junior high. And so Mr. Um, uh, Erickson is the one that started it. I'm just wondering, who was providing the instruments, like violins? Okay, the school board rented out instruments for band. And so they had some string instruments and so they had to multiply their use of stringed instruments and so we ended up getting instruments from quarter size on the way up so that grade three four and five students could actually play wow. so how how is right now nowadays in school well what happened is that they brought in a new superintendent who cut off all the traveling teacher positions cut off the whole string program immediately there wasn't one and that was not only us but uh, it was the uh, uh, outdoor education canceled People who were in, uh, shall we say, like uh, doing math and all these that would go out to the schools because they were smart students who needed or students who were not so smart. And so they were always traveling from school to school. All these positions were canceled. That's you should have seen the rampage that went on downtown at the Calvary <laughs> Board of Education when this guy did this. Yeah, they think it's not necessary for kids to have musical education. I guess. Bad. So when I arrived here in 1989, they had a band teacher who uh, was obligated to also do the choir program, which was called the Lakeside Singers here. So it was part of their contract that if they came in as a band teacher, they would also take over as the conductor of the Lakeside Singers. And when I arrived here, because of my background of teaching in the school system, um, there was no elementary choir. So I made arrangements with uh, Mr. Posnikoff, who was the principal of the elementary school, to come in at lunch times and start a small choir program at lunchtime so that they would have a feeding program going into the high school, etc. And that went on from 1989 to about, oh, 1999. About 10 years. Yeah, for about 10 years, then the Lakeside Centers folded. But that's when I also was doing what we call our Christmas programs, and I would pull people from all the different churches, and so we had a church choir going. And that was just for the community, because it, they would only take certain people in the Lakeside Singers. So this meant that anybody who liked to sing could come and sing in the uh, other one. And so that one developed into what we called our community choir, which has been quiet for a couple of years because of the pandemic. But we're hoping to start up again in the fall. All right, so uh, just a few words about this uh, uh, Arrow Lakes uh, Arts Council. So now, during the pandemic, it was... The Arrow Lakes Arts Council, I guess, formed somewhere in the mid-80s. So it was just in its young youth, shall we say. And the retired superintendent of the schools, Terry Taylor, was the president at that time. And so Karen and Dave McMillan invited me to come to the board meetings and that's how I got started with them. And uh, we would have under our, because we had a charity number, under us would be the Alpha Guild, which is all your artists, creative artists and theater and dance. So we had all these groups under us so that they didn't have to go through the process of having charity numbers we could do all of that work for them. And so they came under as um, members. And so what we had was uh, you paid $5 membership for single persons, you paid $10 for organizations. So I had mine as an organization, uh, Massey School of Music, and eventually I had the string ensemble, and I had the choir. and. Uh, Eventually, one of the choirs split up, and they're now called the Folk Singers. So we have Folk Singers also down in Folk here. And so they're going to try to help us out as much as they can to get everything reorganized again, too. Do you have some government support? 
Yes, we have what we call the Columbia Basin Trust here, and it is um, controlled right now by the Americans so they can have a fresh water supply. The Columbia River has 10 dams on it. It's the most dammed river in North America for the supply of water for the Americans. And that uh, Columbia Basin Trust is now under, shall we say, the 10 year contract is over or whatever it was. And now they're in the process of trying to renegotiate because the Canadians never got anything out of it. Yeah, it has to be changed. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, tell us, what do you think um, needs to be done in order, in order to uh, bloom that you know, education system? Again? Well, when I joined the Air Lakes Arts Council, they put me on as the concert mistress. And so I started traveling through the BC Touring Council to go to Vancouver and meet artists and managers and agents. And so we started bringing in artists from BC and artists from all across Canada. And we actually brought a few in from the United States, usually in the northern states. And like I said, the one exception was Angelique who came from New York. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, what are your wishes to the younger generation? Well, the younger generation today are going to be a tough call because they're too interested in playing games on their little hand machines and this has taken over their lifestyle and the thing that the art schools can do for them is to pull them out of that so that they can start working with individuals. We used to have um, a work thing with the high school because the grade 10, 12s have to graduate with 100 work hours and so we would take students from the high school from grade 10 on upwards and teach them how to do lights and sound for the Arts Council and work with the Arts Council in our concert series. Everything has sort of shut down, so we're hoping that somehow we can get that reorganized again because these young people need to learn that volunteering is a part of lifestyle and needs to be a part of what they learn to do. In fact, one of the members of the um, board right now for the Nicus Council is a former student that I taught. Yeah, and he learned how to do the lights and the sound when he was in high school. So he knows what I'm talking about, and thank goodness we have that connection with our council. Well, Marlon, thank you so much for giving, uh, taking your time, mm -hmm. and uh, I hope more people watch this video, and then hopefully uh, it will be something positive, mm -hmm. positive for the community. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.